He's dead, Jim. Okay, so I'm a closet Trekkie. But the point is, there are certain phrases that just smack of finality and hopelessness. Elijah faced a seemingly hopeless situation, but so did the widow woman. Let's delve deeper into what was going on in this story in 1 Kings 17 and see what we can learn and apply to our lives today. Now, this is really part of kind of a series within the series, if you will, where we're looking at some stuff that was going on with Elijah. We're looking at 1 Kings 17. Last week we were at verse 8. This week we're looking at verse 17. And next week we'll be looking a little further into 1 Kings so our key verse here says, Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? I'm just going to stop right there for a second. And let's look at this. Verse 17 again, now it happened after these things. You know, what are these things? That's always a phrase that we want to look at. What are these things that we're talking about? And these things was the process that Elijah had gone through where he had, he had, he had prophesied about a, a, a drought. And then he'd gone and been fed by the ravens and stayed by the brook. And then the brook dried up. God told him to come to this widow woman and she was going to feed him. And when he got there, she was making her last meal, so to speak, because she didn't have anything. God told him to tell her that if if she made his cake first, that her meal would last and her oil would last. And that became absolutely the way it was. God provided. These are the things that we're talking about. It's after these things have gone on. Her statement to Elijah when he asked him to or when he asked her to make a cake for him was that she was going to make this this last little bit of a of a, a cake for her and her son that you know before they died. She she was kind of hopeless at that point. And it, again, so it's after these things that it says the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. The, if, if you read into this a little bit more, you'll find that it, it talks about just an agonizing experience, his sickness. It was agonizing, and it, and it took his very breath. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been in a situation where you can't get your breath, it's, it's pretty bad. It's not, it's not one of the better experiences you'll ever have in life. It can create panic and anxiety and all kinds of things. And so he came to this place where there, he wasn't breathing anymore. There was no breath left in him. And she says to Elijah, what have, I do, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And so I want you to, in our, our two fears lesson here, I want you to first look at this from a mother's heart. She's a widow, which means that her husband's already been taken away. She's already lost someone, presumably her husband, that's near and dear to her heart. Otherwise, she wouldn't be a widow. And and there's this, this sense of a loss of importance. And I, and I what I mean by that is that her husband is gone, that, that level of provision is gone, that level of protection that may have been there is gone. She's on her own, and now she's faced with her son is is dying, and and so remember she's a mom. She's already had one loss that was, you know, that was significant, and now what's precious to her is being taken away from her. There's there's that whole loss of of everything that's important, and some of us have have been through that experience where you just feel like everything that's important has been taken away from you or everything that you ever cared about or you know it it can be it can come in the form of something that takes your joy or it takes your your happiness it it's 
it's natural when things like these go on that that you are attacked in that thinking and, and your thoughts of, of just being able to be happy or just be able to be at peace or, you know, our, our ability to handle things becomes stressed. Sometimes I'll, I'll look at my wife and say, just one more thing, and not, not her, but one, just one more thing, and, 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 and then that'll be the more than I can handle. Just one more, and then that'll be it, you know? Sometimes it feels like you're about 10 past that level of things that you can handle. This woman in this, in this instance, she is suffering. She's suffering. She's suffering in her, her thought process about this. You know, when, he, when Elijah got there, she was going to make that last meal, that last cake. It says that God had spoken to her. That's what he told Elijah. He'd already talked to this woman. that He'd already let her know that she was going to do this provision. But she's at the point where she has no provision. She's, she's making her last cake when Elijah gets there. And then God prophesies through Elijah that if she does this, he'll take care of the meal, he'll take care of the oil until, the, until it rains again. But we find her at this moment, she's kind of lost focus on that. And you can understand why what's important to her is being stripped away, what's, what's precious to her is being stripped away. But she's lost the focus on the promise of God that she's going to have these things. And, and maybe she's looking at it going, well, yes, God promised that, but he, he didn't promise that he would you know, keep things from happening with my son or what was important to me, whatever it might be. But can you understand the, all the things that are going on in her life at this point? Can you understand the confusion and the, and the hurt? Can you understand that she doesn't necessarily feel like she's being cared for or loved at all? And so she lashes out in that moment and she says, What have I do to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? Have you come to remind me of my failings? Have you come to remind me of my inadequacies? Have you come to, to tell me all the things that I've done wrong, how I'm not deserving of the things that I've had? Have you come to give me a lecture before my son is taken away from me? Is, is it so that my sin can be you know, held up and lifted up high and, and people can know how wrong I've been? And, and you know, this might be a story from many years ago, but we are in a place where when things happen, we fall into that same trap. We, we fall into that trap of looking like it's just this is just to humiliate me. God, is this something that's happening just because I did something wrong? Is, you know, the, all of those accusations come into our mind. And yet the Bible tells us that it's Satan that is the accuser of the saints. We get lost, we lose our focus, and we listen to the lie of the enemy. And it is a lie. It's always a lie. But so she's now lashing out at Elijah because this seems like you've come to, to take this away. And, and, and this, this word, when she says, bring to remembrance, it is a word that's like a flag or or a sentinel, or, or a uh, marker, or something that would draw attention to the, 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 the item. So she's saying, are you, are you setting a flag over my sin with this, this act? That's where she's at. And so she says, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said unto her, Give me your son. And, and the Hebrew there, there's a part of that phrase, Give me your son, that also talks about that flag type moment, that marker, that sentinel moment. So that's, that's our first fear, the, mother, the mother's fear, the, the widow woman's fear. And I want to look at the second part. I said a, a prophet's problem, but I want to look at this from Elijah's perspective for just a minute. 
here is Elijah. I, I said he's a minister of the miraculous. I mean, he speaks and, and he's speaking what God told him, but he speaks and there's no rain. And he, and he goes and follows God's word and he's there by the brook. And he's got ravens bringing him food. Everything's wonderful. And then the brook starts to dry up. And, and, and he goes and he's, goes to this widow woman and, and makes this prophetic word because God's told him that her meal's going to last and her oil's not going to uh, run dry. And it happens. And now it's a matter of life and death with her son. And, you know, as, as a minister, you, you got to stop and think, well, did, you know, is he looking at it going, wow. You know, is that, is that how it goes? I, my, my ministry is all, dries up. It doesn't last. It, it's got high points, but, but they don't last. It's not something that works long term. Is my, is my success just in unimportant areas? That's it. And some of us sometimes have probably been there in ministry. You know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's like, well, someone comes forward for prayer and, and, you know, you lay hands on them and pray and, you know, God heals their headache. They have a pain in their shoulder and God makes, uh, heals them and, and makes the pain go away in their shoulder. And you're so excited. God did a miracle for me. But then you find out somebody has cancer and it seems like you're just praying to the ceiling. And, and I think that's kind of a little bit maybe where Elijah was at this moment when she says, what did I have to do with you? Did you come here to embarrass me about my sin and, and, and kill my son? I mean, he's thinking, well, yeah, but your headache was better, and now the cancer is a problem. Focus is in the wrong place. Listening to the accusations of the enemy, because again, it's the enemy who's going to say, oh, but you, you haven't done anything that matters. He's, he's been a guest of, of hospitality in her home. And now the question really comes up. The question that's being really thrown in his face is, is are you a burden or a blessing? And he might have thought he was a blessing. You know, I'm, I'm, I've come and, and, and uh, told her that her meal's going to last and her oil's not going to run, run out. But in this moment, maybe he just feels like a big burden. What have you gotten us into, God? Elijah here is God's representative. I'm here on behalf of the Most High God. And yet everything seems to be going wrong in this moment. And it's hard to see the past in a positive way when everything's going wrong. It's hard to see it being good when it seems like it's the little things that are that are the only successes you've ever had and it's it's when our focus becomes all on me and my reputation and not on god we start thinking about our reputation god what are people going to think of me god what are people going to say about me god what you know we get it's all about me instead of being all about god and our fear becomes tied up into our reputation and and it's, it brings us to that place as god's representative where we have to face our own fears where we have to recognize that i might be actually just looking at it from my perspective only i might be just looking at my reputation only i might be looking at my ministry i've said before i don't really love that phrase my ministry it's god's ministry 
And if it's not God's ministry, that's probably your first problem. So that's where that's where Elijah's at. And he says in that moment, he says, and this kind of comes up, comes to facing our own fears, too. He does what God's put on his heart. He does what's right at that moment. He says to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Ah, then. He cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodged by killing her son? Elijah's just getting real with God at that point. It, Hey, what's the plan here? Are, did you did you bring me here so I could go through this mess and take her son? And see, he's back to his 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 reputation, and he's not understanding what God's doing at all. And it says he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, "O oh Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him." He's kind of desperate at this moment, but you know, one of the things about when we have to face up to these things is that sometimes. In facing up to those things, we get desperate with God. Sometimes we put all the, the show and the reputation and all those things aside, and we just get a, a, in a place where we're alone with God, and we can get serious about what we need, and we can be honest about what we need with God. And you know what? He's not going to get his feelings hurt if you're honest with him. And Elijah's saying, I don't get it. I don't know if I'm here because, you, you know, some cruel joke you're playing. Is this another one of those things where, where the miracle dries up? What is the deal with this, God? What, what, is, what is the plan that you have here? And it says, then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. He heard the voice of Elijah. Sometimes we pray and we just like to hear our own voice. But when we get to that place of desperation, then I don't think we're picking our words so carefully. I think we're just laying out our heart before God. We're just being honest before God with what's going on. And as, as bad as it sounds, sometimes between the snot and the tears, you actually reach out and touch the heart of God because you get yourself out of the way. And that's kind of where Elijah's at at this moment. It says, The Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. It's a miracle. Just what he needed. Just when he needed it. God provided the miracle. And it wasn't just the headache that God healed, but it was the cancer too. He, it, was, it was the big miracle. That's what Elijah needed. That's what Elijah was crying out for. And that's what Elijah got. See, before we have big miracles in our lives, we a lot of times have to have small miracles so we know God can. And then we have to get to a place where we recognize it's not about me, but it's all about God. And we get desperate with God and we call out to God in all sincerity and all honesty and all earnestness. And when we do, God hears from heaven and he provides the miracle that we need. But see, the enemy never wants us to see that. He wants us to see, oh, it's your sin is in the way again. Oh, your reputation's in the way again. Oh, you're in the way again. Oh, it, God's not listening to you. God's put you out here so you can suffer and be humiliated. God's not going to take care of the big things. He only does the little things just to kind of string you along. Whatever, However your brain interprets it, the problem is we're listening to the enemy. We're listening to the voice of the enemy trying to tell us that God doesn't love us, trying to tell us that God doesn't care, trying to tell us that our sin will continue to punish us forever and ever and ever and ever, and it'll never change. And that's a lie. When we actually get serious and get right with God, and he brings and breathes life back into our situation, when he does the miracle, when we recognize that he is the source of our miracle, when we come to that place with God, then we can begin to see him move, and we can begin to believe him for the bigger miracles. And the things that trouble us right now on a daily basis kind of slip away because they're, they're just insignificant. This year has brought us to a place where we either are going to get desperate or desolate. 
we're either going to get desperate with God, get closer to God and see the miracle, or we're going to get more and more desolate, more and more in a desert place, more and more dry, more and more isolated, and more and more stuck on ourselves to the point that we will, it'll suck our very life away from us. It says that the, the life came back into the, the child and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And again, this is, this is like a flag moment or a, 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 a sentinel moment as he hands the child back to his mother. And he said, see, your son lives. See, God wasn't trying to punish you. See, it wasn't about bringing a moment back to remind you of your sin. See, it was just a moment to show you that God cares. See, it was just a moment to show you that God can do the big miracle. See, it was just a moment to show that it's not going to be something where you're going to have lack. It's not something where you're going to be beaten down and downtrodden. But see, it's a moment when God's going to show his, his grace and his mercy and his power on your behalf. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now, now, by this, I know that you're a man of God. And that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. That's the sentinel moment back to Elijah. Yes, you got desperate before God. Yes, you got the miracle that you needed from God. And now we know that you're telling the truth. Now we know that your God is, is God. Now, now I, my faith is built up because I'm trusting in God just like you. What the enemy meant for evil, God turned to good. We've been doing a summary with each one of these lessons. And our summary today says, what is the fear? And, and our fear no matter how you want to slice it and dice it, is that sin will punish you. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, and that's true. But the Bible also tells us that Jesus Christ came and paid that price, and you don't owe it anymore if you just accept his gift of salvation. And then, and then you don't have to fear that. But it doesn't say that God came gave his son, paid the price for you, but, oh, by the way, we're going to just keep dinging you with interest. Yeah, we paid the principal off, but we're going to charge you the interest just the same as it was there. In other words, God doesn't say, you're a new creation, you're a new creature in me, you are, you are cleansed, you're, you're pure because of what I did, you are saved because of what I did, but, by the way, we want to beat you over the head every chance we get and guilt you into feeling bad about things. That is not how the plan works. The Bible says that his grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. That's, in other words, it's enough. That's all I need. It's, it's actually more than enough. I don't have to worry about the sin thing coming back and punishing me all the time. It's not coming to, to, to get me on, you know, well, that's why this deal went bad is because of sin. That, that, that's why your health went bad is because of some sin. God's punishing you. That's why your kids have had a problem with this, that, or the other thing. You know, it leave, if you b start believing that way, it leaves you always waiting for the other shoe to drop. I got news for you. There's no other shoe to drop except what God did, except what Christ did on the cross for you. Walk in that, trust in that, move in that, get desperate before God in that. Worry about uh, nothing other than you being in step with God. Let his reputation be his problem and not yours. Let your reputation be his problem and not yours. Get yourself out of the way. What is the cause of this sin will punish you kind of thing? Well, it, it really is a lack of confidence in your position in Christ. You're always listening to the voice of the enemy that tells you you're not enough. So you're overcompensating because you're not enough. So I must be going to suffer for that fact. Well, let me just tell you something, and this is really important for you to understand. You're not enough. And that's why he is more than enough. 
because it's not about you. It's about him. It's about the price he paid. How do we overcome? And I wrote this, and it's not a typo. I wrote this, stop believing and start believing. What do I mean? Stop believing the lie of the enemy. Stop believing that somehow you are responsible for making your salvation be enough, that you are responsible for paying for the price of your sin when in fact you can't, but he can. And he did. And start believing that God loves you. Start believing that his grace really is sufficient. Start believing that you really can trust in him and you can stop picking the ball back up and taking it away from him and you can just let him run with it. Start believing that. Why does it matter that we do this? Well, <laughs> the problem is... We, we need to get to this place where we can stop tripping over what's not there. You can, you can go through life and you can keep dodging bullets that aren't being shot at you. You can keep tripping over the same thing that's not there. I, I, in my mind, I see the beginning of the old TV show, the Dick Van Dyke show, where he trips over the uh, Ottoman We kind of look like that, only there's no ottoman. We, we're falling over stuff that's not even that. We're, th we're worried about what somebody's thinking. We know what they're thinking. Well, I know what they're, th I know in their mind, they're thinking that I'm just not smart enough or I'm not whatever. And maybe all they're thinking about is, I wonder if I want to have a burger or a burrito for lunch. But we've got a whole scenario mapped out. We're tripping over it in our mind. Why? Because we keep expecting that other shoe to drop. We keep expecting our sin to trip us up. Stop expecting your sin to trip you up and start expecting that Jesus Christ is going to lift you up. Look for the salvation of the, of the Lord. This is look to the... Look to the mountains for the salvation of the Lord. It says, look, look up. In other words, lift our, our, our sights up. We've talked before about reticular thinking, you know. Um, you, you, uh, I think the example I use is you go down to the car dealership and you buy an electric blue car that, you know, you, that's a color you've never seen before. It's just fantastic. So you buy the electric blue, uh, electric blue car and... You drive home, and as you're driving home, you go, oh, there's an electric blue car. Oh, there's an electric blue car. And for the next three weeks, every car you see seems like it's electric blue. Why? Because your focus was there, and so now rec reticular thinking it means now all of a sudden I'm, I'm thinking about that thing, and so I start seeing that thing, and, I'm, and so it becomes a cycle of discovery of something that was always there, right? Well, if I'm always expecting the other shoe to drop, that's where my mind's at and that's what I'm going to see. But if I'm looking at the salvation of the Lord, if my eyes are lifted up, if I'm focused on him, guess what I'm going to see? I'm going to see the salvation of the Lord and I'm going to see how much he loves me and I'm going to see all of those things. Look up. Our prayer today says this. Savior, I know that you died for me. Help me to grasp what that means. That you love me. You don't hold my sin and failings against me. Let me feel your love today. Give me the strength to believe and walk in true forgiveness and a new life. Amen. Two fears. The widow's fear, the prophet's fear, but all of it's taken away when we begin to look up and we look to, to, to Christ who loves us so much that he died for our sins. He's not looking to beat you up. He's looking to lift you up. And that's it for today.